lifespan.org. Now, uh, look back at a 45-minute portion of the oral argument in Ricci versus DiStefano when it was argued before the Second Circuit Court of Appeals in December 2007. Judge Sonia Sotomayor was joined by Rosemary Pooler and Robert Sack in deciding that case. The last case is Frank Ritchie, if I pronounce that right, and others suing John DiStefano. Good afternoon, guys. I'm Karen Torrey. I represent the plaintiff. Counsel, I'm trying to figure out what defendant or what cause of action you're directing to what defendant. Yes, Your Honor. So who's, who are you suing for what? Understanding that only the entity um, can be sued under Title VII, not an individual. The Title VII claim is against the City of New Haven. Okay, so Title VII is against the city because it's the employer. It's the employer. All right. So Title VII is is the city alone. And then what else do you have against anybody else? The Section 1983 claims for violation of the Equal Protection Clause are asserted against all individuals. Who were decision makers and in failure to certify the tests or? All those involved everyone bringing about this result are, are named in the action. All right, so you're including, with, I think there are only three board members that you charge, three board members? Two, Your Honor. Two board members, and then you have the mayor and the two executive officers, correct? The former corporation council of the city, the city's personnel director, um, the former, um, Chief Executive Officer, as, as well as the Mayor, um, Chief Civil Service Examiner uh, Nolia Marcano is figures prominently in the action order, but she was not named as a defendant. All right. Don't we have, uh, my problem with, with your 1983 cause of action is, do you have any proof that anybody but the board certifies this list or doesn't certify it? Certifies the list, Your Honor. I'm not sure. From the test. Who certifies the list? The board, correct? The board the board takes the list from the personnel director, mm-hmm. looks at it under the standard procedure, and because the charter and the rules limit the duration of the list, it is the board's duty to publish it and, and sign it and give it a start date and an end date. That's their only function. That's the certification of the yeah, list. Yeah, it's a term that's much overused. It's a clerical function. It, the list can only live for two years. So there's got to be some mechanism by which you fix the first day of the list. And the way it works in New Haven is the board at its regular meeting gets these lists and the chairman of the board signs the eligibility. So how do the non-board members get made liable for the failure to certify the list? Because they're the ones who provoked it. The only reason the board failed to certify the list is because the mayor, his staff, prodded them to do so. Without, without the behavior of the individual defendants, that vote never would have occurred. They would have just signed it and the list would have been published and that clients would be promoted. And, and this is an interesting claim with respect to those three other people. Putting aside Politicians every day get up in all types of fora and make what I consider the most ridiculous arguments, some of them illegal. I mean, I've heard politicians say, um, suppress the First Amendment and don't let those rabble-rousers speak. All right? I, I mean, I've heard elected officials say that um, in the press and otherwise. You're suggesting that the mere advocacy of a position can make those three others liable for the decisions or lack thereof of the board? Absolutely, Your Honor. Under what theory? Under the theory of this and every other circuit. Well, if they're not a decision maker, they don't make the decision. The board makes the decision as to whether to certify or not. If they're not a decision maker, why aren't you suing the police officers who spoke against the certification, um, the, the uh, experts who called in? Where do you draw the line as to whom you can sue for expressing a view, a negative view to the, to the certification? Two things, Your Honor. This the law of the circuits and the Supreme Court, particular Smith versus Wade states, that in a Section 
Section 83 claim, and I quote, a plaintiff who suffers a constitutional injury can still assert direct Section 1983 claims against each and every public employee who participated in the deprivation in his or her individual capacity. And it's been... But you keep, you beg my question. Yes. Advocating a position is not participation if you're not a decision maker. Meaning what you are now suggesting is that every public official who speaks against some proposal or another, that that makes them liable for participation in the decision maker's final decision. Where I differ with you, I understand your question, Judge Sotomayor, but where I differ with you is I think you might be getting caught up on the word decision. Don't forget, this is a municipal employer with a charter that requires the strictures of a merit-based civil service system, and it requires competitive testing, a ranked list, a promotion into available vacancies within 120 days of the publishing of the list, and it prohibits the employer from favoring or disfavoring any candidate on the basis of their staff. But the law is written to make all of these requirements contingent on the publishing of that list, correct? I do not agree with that, Your Honor. I do not agree with that. Certification is a clerical task. Ministerial? It's a clerical task. Are you arguing that they had to do it? Yes. Yes, Your Honor, I am. That's what the charter says. And that the reason they didn't is because other people interfered with their ministerial duty by stopping them from doing that? I don't agree. Your Honor, the problem I have with the questions is that if the board was a decision maker, look what the mayor was prepared to do if they voted to certify the list. That's the best answer to your question, Judge Sotomayor. If that board had taken a vote to proceed to send the list over to the fire department to fill those vacancies, the uncontroverted evidence in this record is Mayor DiStefano, as the chief executive of the city, was prepared to issue an edict directing the fire chief to refuse to promote these men. He claimed the authority to control who was going to get those promotions. I appreciate what you're saying. But sometimes... Did he tell the board that? I'm sorry? Did anybody tell the board that before it acted? Are you claiming that the board under duress by the mayor, duress being defined as, you know, the president saying, I'm going to veto the appropriations bill. He's doing that because he wants them to know that he's going to veto the appropriations bill. But I don't think the mayor ever said that publicly to them. Well, one of my complaints is that I thought it was rather dishonest for him not to tell them that. He had it in his back pocket and he was prepared to whip it out to the press the moment the board didn't do what he wanted them to do. But once they tied voted two to two, and the only reason for that is one of the board members was related to one of the minority firefighters who was lobbying for a scuttling of the results. Counsel, one of the amici argues that we should apply the mixed motive analysis to this case. Are you arguing a mixed motive case? I don't see it in your brief, so if you are, I want to know why we shouldn't consider it waived. The question I raised about CIR's brief, I agree that McDonnell Douglas was not the right test to use here, that that was a very awkward exercise by the district court because it's designed to discover whether race played a fact by circumstantial evidence in cases where you must infer it circumstantially. It's not designed for cases where there's no dispute race was a factor. But I do differ somewhat with CIR in the sense that CIR is correct that if there is, if race is a motive and a non-race based motive is also to be discerned from the evidence, then you might have a mixed motive. I agree with that. The problem I have is that I don't see any motive in this case that doesn't have to do with race, no matter which way you look at it. So where's the mixed motive to mix in with the race? That's the trouble I have. And you can use whatever euphemism you like, a concern about adverse impact, diversity, racial imbalance, they're all white, we can't promote them, which is what city officials are telling the board, whichever way you put it, it's all about race. And my position before the district court is that there being no 
dispute that this was a race-based decision by the city of New Haven acting through its appointed officials, that the question becomes, was the use of race lawful? That's how I see it. I guess there is no question, and you're right, that race on some level was a part of this discussion, because the entire discussion before the board was, was there an adverse impact on the minority candidates by this testing procedure? You claim there wasn't because the test was valid. The speakers at the hearing took a different position, that it was, that there was an adverse impact by a neutral test. So my question to you is, can a state ever look at its practices to ensure there's no adverse impact? And are they commanded that if the test is valid, that that's the only way they hire? The state is commanded, Judge Sotomayor, to not use the race of its citizens in a decision ever, unless it has the basis identified by the Supreme Court. Well, but that's going too far, counsel, because the law also says you can't have a racially neutral policy that adversely affects minorities unless there's a business necessity. That's the standard. All right? So the law says you can't do it unless there's a business necessity. So what is the business necessity? Well, there's no dispute that the tests were job-related. But there could be a lot of tests that are job-related that have less of an impact. That's, in fact, what the expert, the competitor expert, told the board, which is there could be a better devised test. That's not sufficient, Judge Sotomayor, to deny. Why not? Because if you are charged as a decision-maker with not adversely affecting an interest, a group, unless there's a business necessity, doesn't the very definition of business necessity mean that you have to look at all the alternatives and see which one best avoids the impact? That is done every single time there's a test. That's why you hire professional testing consultants. Indeed, if you understand the standard protocol that New Haven has always used, but which it suspiciously abandoned in this case and cut off prematurely because they didn't want to listen to it, Chad Legal submitted an affidavit saying that as part of the protocol, when you get the results, you do the technical validation report. And one of the things you do as part of that report was to ensure that the test and its use for selection purposes is lawful under Title VII and you explore alternatives as part of that process. So adverse impact in civil service testing is not an anomaly. It's all but guaranteed. And adverse impact to the extent I understand it has never happened before in New Haven. It happens every time in New Haven, Judge Pooler. It's never not happened. Well, what the board was told, and you're disputing what they were told, was that there were less adverse impact from prior tests than from this one. That's what they were told. That's what they were told, and what I submitted was evidence to show that that was a flat falsehood, a flat falsehood. And statistical errors was one of the things that I, if I had time, I wish to talk about. One of the reasons it was misleading and one of the reasons why it really shouldn't even be here is because in 1999, the city sought to fill 42 lieutenant's positions. The adverse impact and the ratios in that test were no different, no different. They only had one African-American in the top 16 scores. But there were only 42 positions. So when you have that mass vacancy, you can reach further and further down the list. In 2003, they were only seeking to fill seven vacancies. But the actual statistical breakdowns, the adverse impact ratios, the passing rates for Hispanics, for African-Americans, whites, have been consistently the same with almost every test. In fact, in the captain's exam for 2003, there was an improvement in the lack of Latinos. 
in the 1998 captain's exam, the exam produced one qualified Latino for captain. In the 2003 exam, three Hispanics qualified for captain, and all three had been victimized. They, they weren't intended victims, but they ended up being victims because with a two-year list, Your Honor, we don't know how many vacancies are going to arise. So when the city officials stood before the Civil Service Board and said, uh-oh, you can't promote these men, they're white, which is exactly what they said. They looked at the top scores, they looked at what they thought were their vacancies, and they're right on record in saying, we can't promote them, they're white. They were mistaken. Over the two years, vacancies arose. So what happened, but of course, what, what they were thinking at the time they made the decision is what's relevant, not what happened later. I'm perfectly happy to allow the case to turn on what they said at the time, what they knew at the time, because what they did was they admitted these exams were job-related, they admitted they were valid, they stood before Judge Arterton in an oral argument that I thought involves every single pointed question that I was hoping Judge Arterton would ask. When I went into that oral argument, I was hoping the court would ask certain questions and exactly what she did. The first thing Judge Arterton asked was, of the, of the defendants was, is it your position that these tests were not job related and valid? And what was the answer? Your Honor, we have no basis on which to challenge or rebut the fairness and validity of these tests or the job relatedness of these tests. The next question was, all right, what's your, what alternative do you have in mind? What's the alternative? And I'd like to give you the exact quote because I think it's meaningful, meaningful for purposes of the Supreme Court's equal protection jurisprudence. Well, we, we don't know if we have a different result. The truth is that the record admittedly is not vetted out as to an alternative. There would have to be studies done to show that those alternative methods would be substantially similarly valid, but that's not what we're dealing here because we're not at that stage. And in response to pointed questions from Judge Arnton on the very linchpin for disparate impact liability under Title VII, the linchpin for disparate impact liability, if the test is job related, is to show that there is an equally valid, available, equally valid alternative with demonstrably less adverse impact. And at oral argument at the district court, when Judge Arnton said, what is your alternative? What did they say? Judge Arnton, that's a question for another day. Both counsel and the record and Ms. Marconi admitted that Dr. Warner didn't even look at those examinations. But they don't have to have the alternative. All they have to do is know that they had an unfair test and there were alternatives that wouldn't have the same unfair results. I disagree that that's the law, Judge Pooler. Did they have to have an alternative? Are you telling me they had to have an alternative? Or they just had to look at this and say, we have disparate impact? You have disparate impact in almost every civil service exam in every urban area in this country, Judge Pooler. This is not an anomaly. You're listening to a portion of the oral argument before the Second Circuit Court of Appeals in Ritchie v. DiStefano, a case stemming from a lawsuit filed by white firefighters in New Haven, Connecticut, against city officials who threw out a promotion exam because no African Americans and only two Hispanic firefighters passed. Supreme Court nominee Sonia Sotomayor was one of the three judges who decided the case, along with Rosemary Pooler and Robert Sack. Next, some of the argument from Richard Roberts, attorney for the city of New Haven. If this court were to uh, reverse the summary judgment, you're sending a signal to employers and municipalities, don't, don't self-remediate. Just um, certify these exams, um, don't even look into alternatives, and uh, we'll, we'll simply let you Well, do I don't know that that's as far as your adversaries are proposing. What they're saying is you should remediate, but you shouldn't permit race to be the driving force on either end uh, um, on your choice well, that it should be based on some objective standard you have to look at the test and determine whether the test was in fact fair or not and if you're going to say it's unfair point to specifics of ways it wasn't and make sure that there really are alternatives to a, that there really is a fairer test. Sure, but I think I think you're never really going to know if another testing method, be it a test or otherwise, is going to have adverse impact until you administer it. You can, you know, all you really can get is an opinion that another test, in fact.
Act may address adverse impact. But this is exactly what Title VII encourages. It's for employers to say, look, we have a presumptively discriminatory test. Let's, let's step back and try to do it better. Let's look into the alternatives. That's what we're prepared to do, but not for the challenge in this lawsuit. What so we will do if, if you uphold the summary judgment, and, and we, we haven't had that opportunity. But that's, that is what Title VII requires. This case really boils down to a single point, which is that the intent to remedy disparate impact in, with minorities is not the equivalent to an intent to discriminate against non-minorities. Let's bear in mind, Your Honors, that plaintiff bears the burden, in this case under the McDonnell-Douglas uh, presumption shifting framework, which the plaintiffs can see applies here, to prove that the defendants intentionally discriminated against them because they're Caucasian, or in, in one case, uh, Hispanic, and that that was the determinant factor in the decision. Well, how is this case different than the 11th Circuit's case in Williams versus Consolidated City of Jacksonville? And the court there said that a prior chief's decision not to establish four captain positions for promotion was illegal because the reason he made that decision was not to promote the four white men. How is that different than this situation? Well, in this case, we didn't, we didn't take any steps. I mean, we, we, we simply are looking for another you didn't, sir. How is that different from not establishing the four captain's positions? You didn't certify a list that would have led inexorably to the appointment of, of some of the plaintiffs. Of the plaintiffs. Well, of one of them, more of the plaintiffs, not, not each one individually, but at least one of three of them. But we're, we're starting all over. We don't know where the plaintiffs are going to land in this case. So it actually has a less... Uh, no, a less well, no, you knew that after the test. You knew what their test score was and what order they had come in. True. Well, we, the first top three had to be offered for promotion. One of correct. the three had to be picked. What we, what we don't know is where um, an alternative method um, that we have a reasonable belief in would... would well, but you still haven't told me where the board had any evidence to base a decision that a reasonable alternative existed well, or uh, would exist to improve these numbers? Well, again, Your Honor, I think they did, they did have several sources um, in, in the hearings. Um, but it's, it's not so much the issue of whether there definitively even was a, a reasonable alternative, frankly. I think there, there, there is evidence. And whose burden is it to supply the reasonable alternative? It's the plaintiff's burden to show pretext. And it would be the, the plaintiff's burden to show that there, in fact, um, are no other reasonable alternatives. Mind you, the board has heard no testimony that there, that there are none. They only heard testimony that there were, there were such a, a reasonable alternatives. I, I'd like to turn... But opposing counsel argued that you didn't prove that there was a reasonable alternative. Do you think that that was impermissible shifting of the burden? I do. I, I think, we, number one, we did prove it. Number two, even if we didn't prove the existence of alternatives, we proved a reasonable belief in that, which is what this court has described in uh, Graham versus Long Island Railroad, where, where if, even if you are offered non-discriminatory reason is wrong, is so long as it's made in good faith, you still um, have an established pretext. The fact that we relied on is whether or not there were reasonable alternatives. This is not a, an issue of law. Um, although, frankly, we cited the case Hardy, uh, a, a district court case in, in Louisiana that states even a mistaken belief of law would be a, a valid defense. But how could it be good faith if you just didn't like the racial composition of the people who finished at the top of the list? Isn't that just as prohibited as, um, uh, as trying to as discriminating against any uh, any racial class? No, Your Honor. With all due respect, I mean the, the fact the fact that uh, I mean a discriminatory purpose implies that the decision maker picked this course of action because of, not really in spite of the adverse effects on an identifiable group. In this case, it would be the, the, the Caucasians, and in one case, the, an Hispanic. Um, that's not what we have here. As, as this court and other courts have held, any kind of measure against discrimination by its very nature, by its very design, involves some element of being race conscious. That's not the question here. The question is, did, did we were we doing it to comply with the law? And has the plaintiff met the burden of showing, oh, that's all pretext. It 
was really because you had some intent to discriminate against us because of our race. Well, counsel, this really begs a lot of questions. There have been many a case where employers have instituted racial preferences that the courts have struck down and even denied a good faith claim, a good faith defense, because they thought they had to remedy racial imbalance in some way. And we've said you can't do it in the way you've chosen to do it because it inappropriately takes race into consideration. You haven't answered my question of why this is different than Williams, where the court is saying you can't use race to make an employment decision if your reason is just racially motivated. You have to, basically I read Williams as saying, you've got to have some reasonable basis to conclude that what you're doing is wrong. And unless you have an alternative, if you don't show the test is invalid and you've refused to say the test was invalid, correct? Opposing counsel pointed to testimony from one of your witnesses that the test was fair and job related. Well, there's never been a validation study. No side has disclosed experts, so no one knows in fact whether it would pass a validation study. Didn't someone in deposition say that to the best of her knowledge it was fair? Well, she's not qualified to talk about that issue. I mean, she's just an examiner for the city who said we tried to make it fair. So there was no evidence that the test was fair and or job related. That's correct. And again, we're talking about the plaintiff challenging our measure, if you will, or actually not certifying, so they would bear that burden. But even whether or not it would pass muster in a validation study is not the issue. The issue is... Why isn't it the issue? If you have a charter that commands you to certify, the charter says the board has to certify the test that's valid. Yes. So doesn't that say it has to make a finding that the test is invalid before it doesn't use it? Sure. And if it's using race to make that determination, isn't that illegal? Not if the only race conscious remedy involves a concern for discriminating based on an anti-discrimination statute, Title VII. In other words, if all we're... I mean, of course it takes into account the race of the candidates. It can't not in order to be a race conscious remedy. But the reason, compliance with Title VII is perhaps the paramount reason that any employer could ever do a way with an exam. I did want to make one reference, Your Honor, to a district court case in Tennessee where the employer did exactly what the plaintiff is suggesting that we do, which is to use a test that was presumptively discriminatory. They even went through a validation study. We didn't cite it in our brief. It's a fairly new case about a year ago. But it's Johnson v. Memphis, and it's 2006 Westlaw 3827-481. And in that case, the court held that the employer should have done exactly what we did, which is frozen the promotions and replaced it with a better new procedure. The standard that they adopted was the issue was whether we should have known or knew or should have known of other alternatives. And, in fact, in that case, the plaintiff merely offered certain alternatives, suggested them. There wasn't even any testimony as we have here. So I think that case supports our position. Your Honor, I also just wanted to comment on Williams for a moment. I think that that case didn't really consider whether the defendant violated the Equal Protection Clause. It talked about whether the defendant was immune from liability, and there really wasn't any full analysis of equal protection. There's no mention of racial classifications. And I also think, frankly, that that ruling is contrary to the rulings in Bushey, Hayden, and Kirkland. I think it is. If you read it the way you do, Your Honor, I think that it simply is inconsistent with our holdings that have said an employer has a compelling interest in using voluntary measures to remedy past or present discrimination. So there really is no such requirement, to my knowledge, in that circuit. Your Honor, again, the question, what the board did here is it 
it took a pause back. It, it got a legal opinion that I think was a sound legal opinion, certainly in good faith. Um, the decision makers were the two members of the board who voted not to certify. We've supplied affidavits from the decision makers that say, listen, we in good faith voted to not certify for concern that to do so would be um, violating Title VII. And, and, and the opinion that was given by Corporation Counsel to the board stated that if you certify an exam that has adverse impact, where there are uh, equally valid alternative methods to promote that are less discriminatory, you're violating federal law. Regardless of what the charter says, regardless of what the union agreement may say, certainly federal law trumps those um, municipal codes. So, we, so we, the, the board was bound, but that again is not even the test. The test here under this, this, this court's decision in Graham versus LIRR is whether there was a good faith belief in the non-discriminatory reason, even if it was wrong. We don't think it was wrong, by the way. I think, I think the amount of evidence is that it was correct. The plaintiff would have the burden uh, to show uh, that that offered non-discriminatory reason was pretext, and, and they simply failed to do that. I mean, frankly, a lot of what this record is is, is speculative conclusions, um, inadmissible evidence, be, either be it hearsay or unauthenticated, but it, it, doesn't, it doesn't create any issues as to uh, the fact that, that the, the uh, motivation here was to not violate the law, simply stated. And even if we're wrong in that, it, I don't think it's fair for the courts to second-guess employers uh, who make good faith uh, judgments. More importantly, I think... In conclusion? I'm sorry, Your Honor? Is that an in conclusion? In, in conclusion, Your Honor, um, I, I believe that... <laughs> A, a desire to eliminate discriminatory impact of hiring practices on minority applicants is not the same as an intent to discriminate against non-minorities. That's what Hayden said. Um, to self-find would seriously stifle attempts to remedy discrimination if employers or governmental entities fear they'll be charged with discriminating against non-minorities. In fact, they will shy away from all proper efforts to rectify proper discrimination. The city did the right thing here, Your Honors. Um, they did not certify based on a, a presumptively discriminatory exam when they heard uh, credible uh, information regarding alternatives. Um, and at a minimum, they certainly had a good faith belief that's, that is not disputed. So we believe the uh, summary judgment should be upheld. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Council. Ms. Torrey, you have reserved four minutes. I'm going to try and keep you to the four minutes. Thank you, since the 1980s case law on which defendant relies, Congress amended Title VII to prevent the very type of race norming and alteration of results that this court once approved. You can't do that anymore because Congress specifically prohibited it. But with that aside... Um, but did you hear counsel um, allude to Hayden versus County of Nassau? Hayden, Why isn't that dispositive in this Hayden case? Hayden has so... It's the most foreign set of facts of this case, Judge. Hayden Hayden did, one of the reasons this court reached its conclusion in Hayden was because they said nobody, nobody lost anything. They had, nobody had taken the test yet. That was a bizarre set of facts where not only sued to stop the city from even developing a test. Um, that, there's no resemblance to this case. In fact, the court applied equal protection analysis. They said, look, no one was hurt here. No one was burdened. No one lost an opportunity. There were so did Judge Arderton here. So did Judge Arderton. She said no one was hurt here either. No one was hurt? Oh, For heaven's sakes, Judge, if, if they didn't refuse to fill the vacancies, these men would be lieutenants and captains. How can you say they weren't hurt? They're out of thousand dollars apiece. Half of their marriages were strained by this. They spent three months of their lives holed up in a room like I was and you were when you took the bar exam. I, with all due respect to Judge Arderton, I think a fundamental failure is the application of, of these concepts to this job as if these men were garbage collectors. This is a command position in a first respondent agency. The books you see piled up on my desk are fire science books. These men face life-threatening circumstances every time they go out. In the well, you might kind of agree with me. Please look at the examinations. They're under seal. It's volume three. You need to know this is not an aptitude test. This is a high-level command position in a post-9-11 era, no less. They are tested for their knowledge of fire behavior, combustion principles, building collapse, truss roofs, building 
construction, confined space rescue, dirty bomb response, anthrax, metallurgy. And I opened my district court brief with a plea to the court to not treat these men and this profession as if it were unskilled labor. We don't do this to lawyers or doctors or nurses or accountants or even real estate brokers. But somehow, we treat firefighters as if it doesn't require any knowledge to do with the job. Firefighters die every week in this country, and when I opened up my brief, I told Judge Arterton of a case right a few miles away where young father and firefighter Eddie Ramos died after a truss roof collapse in a warehouse fire because the person who commanded the scene decided to send men into an unoccupied house with no people to save on Thanksgiving Day with a truss roof known to collapse early in the fire because of the nature of the pins that hold the trusses together. Well, it collapsed, and for 20 minutes, he couldn't find any air. He suffocated to death. And the fire chief had to go tell a six-year-old her father was coming home. I'm not being histrionic. That happens all the time. And if you can't pass a competency exam and answer substantive job knowledge questions, I think the only compelling governmental interest or Title VII interest I see... Counsel, yes. I, I, I... We're not suggesting that unqualified people be hired. The city's not suggesting that, all right? Um, but there is a difference between where you score on the test and how many openings you have, and to the effect and to the extent that there's an adverse impact on one group over another, so that the first seven who are going to be hired only because of the uh, vagrancies of the vacancies at that moment, not because you're unqualified. The pass rate is a pass rate, all right? But if your test is going to always put a certain group at the bottom of the pass rate so they're never, ever going to be promoted, and there is a fair test that could be devised that measures knowledge in a more substantive way, then why shouldn't the city have an opportunity to try to look and see if it can develop that? Because they've already developed it. You want to tell it assumes the answer. It assumes the answer, which is that um, that the test is valid because we say it's valid. The testing consultant said it was valid. He told them it was valid. Valid for use under Title VII. They had evidence that the test was job-related and valid for use under Title VII. You didn't and come up. You didn't present an alternative, did you? I, sh I have an alternative. Alternatives rather than harming 20 men? First of all, if they really care about including women minorities, why are they standing here in this courtroom when they could have gone back and said, oh, we just realized we had more vacancies than we thought? They've, they've deprived three Hispanics of promotion to captain, three African Americans of promotion to lieutenant, off of that list. And when they found out about that error due to their own folly, what did they try to do? They tried to hide it from me? to extract that information out of them because they refused to give us the scores. We had heard scuttlebutt that they miscalculated vacancies and six minorities, three Hispanics, three African Americans were deprived of promotions because of this race racketeering with, with boys and Kimber. His friends weren't going to get promoted. That's what we were trying to convince this court of. This wasn't about concern over Title VII. They've had the similar results in every test they've ever had. So you're, sa you're saying finally at the end of this argument that, that, that when the city says the test had disparate impact, it was pretextual. Is that what you're saying? Well, it was pretextual. I'm but that's, what, that that's your burden. I'm saying it's strong evidence that this was really about what we said it was about. So you said it's pretextual when they said it was it had disparate impact? Is that final? That had nothing to do with that board decision. That had So you are to do. saying that when the city says that this test created disparate impact, it was a pretext for other reasons. You bet it was, Your Honor. It was because Boise Kimber's cronies were so that, on the list. So that's your argument. Right. You, you just, think you have carried the final prong of McDonnell Douglas by proving it's pretextual, and then you have to prove it is discriminatory, and that's your argument, I right? can't agree with you on that, Judge Pruler. I don't think McDonnell Douglas applies. I, here's how I look at it. It's a, here's how I look at it. 
If anything, if we learned anything from the court's equal protection jurisprudence and most recently June's, bless your honor, this June's decision in parents involved, as Justice Thomas and Justice Kennedy and the other four justices mentioned, of the three, the number of occasions on which government can point to a group or individual's race in order to make a decision when application of strict scrutiny applies, it's almost always fatal. And the Supreme Court has given the clear direction that they've only allowed it in the rarest of circumstances, and as Justice O'Connor noted in Croson, before government can ever use race, point to the race of an individual or a group of individuals, and then make a decision based on that, as they did here, you need a strong evidentiary basis, you need a compelling governmental interest, the remedy must be narrowly tailored, and you must not harm, unduly harm, non-minorities. They couldn't meet one of those four criteria here, Judge. Not one. Not one. And it's in the summary judgment context. If you really care about minorities, why didn't you reinstitute the list when you found out that you just deprived three Latinos and three African Americans? That gives you a clue about what the real motive is. Why didn't they come back and say, we were mistaken. We just deprived six minorities out of a job, and we were all about saying we want inclusion of minorities? That was ludicrous. In the summary judgment context, why didn't they band the candidates together? Why didn't they come to them and say, look, let's go to the union, let's have everyone be eligible to be picked. If there's one principle of equal protection jurisprudence, even if you can go to a remedial measure, even if you disagree with me and say that New Haven had a right to proceed to a race-based remedy for disparate impact, it remains that the directive of the U.S. Supreme Court is that you must choose it narrowly, choose the most narrow one, have a tight fit between the remedy and the ill, and you must not displace the innocent. They ran roughshod over everybody, went right in the weak track to the most drastic race remedy of depriving everyone, everyone. I don't know what this is. This is where we'll have to stop. What's that? I said this is where we'll have to end this argument. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. You can watch this or other C-SPAN programming featuring Supreme Court nominee Sonia Sotomayor at any time by visiting our website. Look in the Featured Topics section under Supreme Court. That's at cspan.org. And join us each Saturday evening for America and the Courts, our weekly look at the federal judiciary. It starts at 7 Eastern on C-SPAN.